There are a lot of families that come back up and, and just look and see and, re, and remit, reminisce. And, uh, but it was a good town. You know, uh, it's it, because it's a, it's a family. See, Red River, even though it was a comfy town, it was it united everybody. We were concerned for others. We didn't, I never turned my back on anybody. And like I said, in Old Town, if I was in front of Villa Lopez's house and was hungry, Mrs. Mendoza would bring me in the house. Ate at uh, your grandma's house, the Florida. And he says, you'll never find another place like this. Nowhere. You'll never find another place like this. And I found that out. But I remember the town was just, it seemed to me to be a wonderful town, of course. The big store was active then. When I was in high school, the fun of going down there and uh, sitting in the in the fountain and drinking cherry coke or chocolate coke. I don't. You probably, if you walked in and ordered a cherry coke, some place they would laugh you out of there <laughs> if they even knew what you're talking about. That field down there, and they had bleachers, and you could go down there morning, noon, or night, and you could watch a ball game. Oh, it was wonderful. It was just a wonderful town to be born and raised in. My dad worked when we first got here. He worked on the mill. He, he was, um, worked on the pond. He pushed the logs up into the sawmill. Oh, you had to know Dr. Lever. And Dr. Lever was a cat's meow. I think he was a colonel or a major in the military and treated everybody with dignity. We did so many things in school. You never, go, you were never bored. You were involved, and teachers were involved with you. Roller skating. Used to love to go to that roller skating rink. Do you have some memories of that? What oh it was yeah, like? I had a lot of poles. <laughs> It was mostly like an international settlement, to tell you the truth. It was a lot of Italians, Spanish, Mexicans, Greeks, Norwegians, all of them. Uh huh. Did your family make And you could smell a lot of wine. Yeah, I was just going to ask I knew about you the were. wine. I knew you were. <laughs> so when Mr. and Mrs. Walker got here from Minnesota, uh, it was a very nice, small town, and uh, we had a lot of work. There was a lot of work, you know, in the sawmill, the box factory, the sash and door, and then the Venetian line department, and it was a place where men could work and make a living. Old town, where it's families that had kids, because they were working families, so that's about the right age for the parents to have kids. So we did a lot of things that young kids do. Oh, well, while our parents sat outside at night watching us, you know, and keeping an eye on us, we were playing kick the can or anything we could do, but it was fun. Monopoly would go on for hours and hours and hours, all kinds of squabbles about who owned what property. <laughs> and then we had a lot of outdoor games, and we did funny things like kids do. But our mothers couldn't keep that little stick in the bottom of the curtains because they had curtains that had a stick in them. But the stick was real flexible to make a hell of a sword blade. So we took those and made blood. And if an air plant was always good to us, we could go down there and apply with one tip, the sheeting. And we would take that and then we would cut it. Old time guys we had a how we didn't have a dime, you know. So we made everything ourselves. So we cut these sticks and made our kite, you know, you take uh, paste and you take newspaper and you put it over. And guys up here, some of the guys were boiler, they had, they had that real wrapping paper they put in shoes boxes, you know. Ours wasn't, you know, ours was like armored tanks flying <laughs> in the sky. Uh, the streets would be packed down with hard snow or ice. Because they plowed the roads different, they didn't try to get it down. It had a pack of that much, you know. And a lot of kids had sleds, and a popular activity was be to run 
belly flopping, we used to call you hold the sled and you run and you throw yourself down and you could glide a long way. Well, if you were skillful enough, you could glide and catch the bump of a car going by and get a ride. And they would take you out and then you'd release over here and wait for the car to come back in the old town, hook on to it. And then you started getting brave and you started hooking onto the trailer. The one guy and then the next guy and, next, and that got dangerous because then they started to whip and you, you never see what's coming. It was uh, not a good thing to do. I don't remember anybody ever getting hurt, but of course you could have gotten slid under the car or something. <laughs> we would always have uh, rock fights, of course. <laughs> Me and Floyd Cooper, uh, I don't know. We never got along real good. We got in a rock fight, I forget, I don't know what, it's a little or nothing. Pretty soon we had 10 guys on this side, the 10 guys on that side throwing rocks back and forth. But that's what we would do, entertainment was right there at our end. We never stayed in the house. I don't remember staying in the house, you know. The popular activity among my age mates at about 12 or 13 was rubber guns. I don't know if there's such a thing now, but it was a, a replica of a rifle or a pistol. Some looked like the real things, well, you know, they would. Some didn't, but they had a, um, you put a close plan on it and you'd stretch a rubber band from the front of the thing back and hook the back end in the close pin. Then you tie a knot on them so you want to teach a guy a lesson, don't sneak up on me. <laughs> you hit him with one of those real bad ones. Milk was delivered to your home and those are the days of, you have bottles up here in the, in the yeah. shelf where they had the cream on the top and uh, the milk on the bottom, and they had cardboard milk tops. Those are valuable to us, because we took the, hell, we'd have them in our pocket, you know, rolled up. They're like half dollars. And what you do is you, you form a, a, a circle there, and you throw them down, and then the guy throws it down. If your stick's on it, you get his, you know? And so the ticket was to win milk tops, and as they got older, they got worn, and they would stick better, so that, uh, God, you don't even have milk tops anymore, but it was a fun game. Growing up in Westwood is uh, is unique. We used to go down and, and uh, skate on Walker Lake. We called it Sewer Lake in those days, but I think that was a different segment. Yeah, I can remember skating down there, and the old clamp-on skates, that you, like the roller skates. Uh, and then I... Some kids would go down there. Occasionally, someone who owned a Model A would get down there and get it out on the ice in a really heavy winter. And uh, those were kind of exciting times. Friends took me out to what we call Sewer Lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, ice skating. So I had the ice skates. We went out there. They had drug me out in the middle of that dumb thing, and I couldn't, my feet didn't do anything except flop and flip and do what I did not want them to do. I sat down on there, took those skates off, walked across that ice on my stocking feet, got my shoes on, and I walked home and I never went back on the ice. If it really got cold, we were out there by the dam. And if you had a pressure cat cut, you took off in a hurry. And we'd skate over there from one side, dare. I dare you to skate all the way across to the other side. Mm -hmm. See, we take off where the boat ramp is right now at the dam, and uh, I skate like mad. And then, uh, and if we hear a pressure cack, somebody would yell it out. And that means, you know, watch out. Winters were, were pleasant times in town. The snow deal, we would take a wine barrel. Every once in a while, you get the old wine barrel. They were, they were the Cadillac for an old donner because then you could take and you could sand the bottom of them. It had the right curvature. You take a pair of old shoes or leather and you cut a strap and then nail it on the side. So then you had a, like, a, like a, a horse thing, you know, stirrup, and you put those on it. And we would carry those things out to Round Mountain. And Round Mountain, you know, it's nice. And if you were brave, you'd go off the, the west side. And if you were a coward, you kind of went off the east side. You could walk downtown and not worry about it, or your folks could send you for a loaf of bread. But growing up was uh, here, is that you knew everybody. 
I never turned my back on anybody. And like I said, in Old Town, if I was in front of Villa Lopez's house and was hungry, Mrs. Mendoza would bring me in the house. Ate at the, your grandma's house, the Flores. And um, everybody was nice, to tell you the truth. We never had any problems or anything like that. And uh, like I said, it was like an international settlement. There was a lot of Italians and Mexicans and Spanish and Greeks and Germans. And everybody got along. If you didn't smell a sausage going in, you smell wine. <laughs> we made our wine with a lot of them with their feet, you know, clean. And, uh, and a lot of them didn't do the feet, you know. They had the machine. Mm -hmm. But uh, they did it at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And us kids, when we were little, we w would, uh, we didn't want to go to bed. We wanted to stay up, and then everybody would wait for the, uh, the men to come home from Susanville with wa uh, grapes to make wine. And they all came at night. No, it was nice, it really was. And everybody got along, and everybody borrowed from each other, whether it was flour or sugar or something, you know, and then we would give it back. You know, and all that. And then Dr. Levin always came to the house, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one time he came to the house to treat me, and my dog, my cat had broken its leg, and, and Dr. Levin went over by the wood stove, t took about, I don't know, maybe a half hour, had my dad or my mom go out, get two sticks, and he shut the cat's leg. And he was quite a heavy smoker. Oh, he had a cigarette in his mouth all the time. And uh, I was just more worried about the ash falling on me as he examined me, if I had a sore throat or something like that. Because he was smoking even in his office, you know, and I, I think that's probably one of the reasons I didn't want to really get involved with smoking, you know. <laughs> but uh, a very good doctor. He was the, uh, the Hollywood stud, that guy. Good looking. He would walk down the sidewalk with a cigarette and singing. He always sang, and he could sing good and he could play the violin. And treated everybody with dignity. I didn't give a damn if you had a dollar or if you had a thousand. I mean, I'm sure he uh, treated the plant walker a little better than not, but I'm, I'm sure at the end service was the same. Did you know um, Fletcher and Evelyn Walker? I knew, I, I, yes, I knew them to the extent that most kids knew them in town. I attended Mrs. Walker's uh, Sunday school class up at the People's Church and she used to invite the kids down. Every Sunday after church, we'd go over there and have uh, fellowship, play, go through the, the rooms. They had, they had trophy heads in there from, I guess, the, young, the younger Walker kids hunted in Africa. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Fletcher did, well, I don't know who did, but anyway, they had uh, a lion's heads and other things in there that for uh, kid in Westwood. <laughs> it was pretty impressive to get in there. I remember them going around Old Town uh, every Sunday because he had to stop and get a glass of wine. <laughs> his, his wife didn't want him to drink at all. But every time they took a ride around Old Town, she would let him stop <coughs> and talk to the Italians and get a glass of wine. The thing that, that was amazing is uh, what they did for the community. And I look back now and I, I, thank, I thank them for all the things that they did for helping me because uh, without some of that help, I couldn't have finished college. Oh, it was wonderful. It was just a wonderful town to be born and raised in. Uh, all the corner houses were painted and they were steam heat. And on, uh, if you went to work or uh, went to school, you walked on the wooden sidewalks because they were all clear because the steam that ran from the mill came up to the high school and that was steam heated. And then we had the clubhouse building, which is Young's and all of that. And they had, um, they played pool and they played poker and all games, but the women weren't allowed to walk in there. So she, they would have to wait 
wait for a man to come out and say, well, would you go in and get my husband for me? So they would do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, what the big store was, that was, that was quite the, I think that was the first shopping mall in the country of the United States, I think. I don't think there was another mall in t the area that could hold candle to it. It had everything. You went into that store and that was it. Uh, you know, they had everything you could buy. The fishing licenses and tires for cars and they had the pharmacy there. And uh, I remember the, I'm not sure how early it was, but they had a, uh, what would you call it? We had a balcony around the, uh, and there were some shops up there. At one time, the barber shop was up there, and um, the main market, of course, and the grocery store. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, men's and women's clothing. Oh yes, the big store was uh, the highlight. Uh, after every game, the the soda fountain was open, and so uh, after every game or any activity, you all congregated down at the uh, the big store. There used to be a shooting range here, by the way. Underneath the big store, they had an indoor shooting range where you could go down and shoot 22s. They, they had one bunch for boys, and, went, and so when the women and us girls started, <laughs> the men says, now look at that, look at that wall over there. The boys did all that, they just went shooting all over. Because <laughs> she and, and Santos, her sister, older sister, we used to go down there and shoot. Were the girls better shots than the boys? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were really proud of all of us girls. <laughs> years and years ago, when the mill, when everything was going, when they had three shifts of workers going, I mean, they had people coming and going to work here all the time. And down at that far end, they call it, used to call it Tunison Field. You could go down there morning, noon, or night, and you could watch a ball game. Because people that were coming off of work wanted to play ball. And then the walkers would get baseball players up from San Francisco to come up and play ball up here. And it was amazing to watch those guys play baseball. I love, I learned, I picked up that game real quick watching those guys play ball and I loved it. And everybody, I mean the stands were always full. Everybody loved their baseball. Uh -huh. So that was another good thing that I, I remember real well. And crossing the Mill Pond Bridge was fun. Uh, we would go into the uh, uh, ponds and walk across the bridges and uh, if you were daredevil, you walk the logs. Go over the bridge and step on the logs. And we weren't supposed to. Oh, I bet not. But you know what kids do. We played on the log. And then the logs, you spin them, you go off of them. And there were certain logs that, once the bark is gone, it's like a grease pig. And so hell, you hit those and go in. And my cousin, he fell in one time, there was logs, he fell there. We pushed the logs over him. You know, yeah, to swim out around the log, you know. I say, God, I tell my kid, I don't want my kids to tell me they did that. But we did that kind of stupid crap. And, and that little bridge led over to Pine Town, Old Town. Mm -hmm. And that's what connected that. And the kids that, that would go there uh, would hustle over there, have lunch, and come back again. But in those days, uh, we had a lot of snow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but still, the men and women went across the bridge and went to work. Hi. They would take, a, a lot of them would take shovels with them and clean the snow off of the bridge as they went by because to get the women to go to the store to shop for food or get the kids to go to school. And so they would clean all of that. What did you and your friends do for fun? What kinds of things were the Roller do? skating. Used to love to go to that roller skating rink. Do you have some memories of that? What oh yeah, like? I had a lot of poles. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and I went roller skating every Sunday. And I remember saving my money so I could go roller skating with Char Ed, Charlie Monroe. Charlie had a skating rink, twist on skates. <clears throat> See if I can still hear that organ music in the background and they all skate and he had one of those lighted balls that go around. And I used to be a darn good roller skater, especially with the men. <laughs> How's I mean, do you ever heard of when you're, you're roller skating with a man, it's a couple, mm -hmm. and then they had the big screen that said uh, triple, so I have a woman in the middle and two men on the side, and you just go around and round and round and have a mm -hmm. nice time. So that the auditorium was a great source of, uh, of fun skating, and then they had the dances there, uh, town dance. They used to have a fireman's ball once a year. It was a big town-wide event. And then they had other things down there. That, uh, that auditorium had a balcony as well, and so you could go upstairs and you could watch the uh, ball game or the dancing or whatever. And my sister had to take me in, would she? Oh, God, and that's how I remember the polls, because they all have my name on it. She had, my mother told her to take me roller skating with her, and she didn't appreciate it, because she was almost five years older than me. But anyway, she took me, and she took and drugged me, and I swear she made me hit every one of those poles in that building. <laughs> I'd go home black and go, oh, I had a great time, but uh, no, I didn't. She almost <laughs> killed me, but it was fun. We survived. Charlie was a big influence in this town, of course. But he was so good to the kids. There was uh, so many things that he did for the students and the kids up here in school. And the roller skating was one of the popular things that they went to. Sort of miss it because it was inside. And then Charlie had the bowling alley. Uh, I think it had three alleys, three lanes. And you could bowl, I don't know, 10 cents a line or something like that. And we'd go in there and you, if, for a fee, a less fee, you set your own pins. And that means when the, they knock the pins down, you get down there and you put them up in a rack, pull the rack down, and you got 10 cents a line for that, which was pretty good. Uh, then that makes me think of the theater. The theater, of course, was a favorite spot. That was a good place, too. Mm -hmm. Good movies and stuff. Yeah. And you couldn't not afford to go for 10 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. And every Saturday my father would let me go to the movies, oh. watch a movie. And uh, when the movies were on, the theater was loaded with people. In those days there was usually a whole, you know, there'd be the newsreel. And during the war there was always these grainy black and white things that were all scenes in Europe or Japan or whatever. And then they had cartoons. They'd always have a couple of cartoons. And they had a serial, uh, which would be something that was continued every Saturday. And so it would be Flash Gordon and the Mud Men or Hopalong Cassidy and the Wild Bandits. And so there would be a climax and then it'd stop and then you'd, that would be an attraction for you to come back the next time and see it. And of course, it's just legendary in Western. The theater had lights along the side so if there was a fire in town those lights would come on and that would be a signal to the volunteer firemen that something was going on they were needed so you'd see you know men would get up and, and leave oh the theater was beautiful and uh they'd have the floor down there and it had two doors one on each side and then it had the upstairs and you would go up to the upstairs if you wanted to see the loge the lodges, you know, uh -huh. and everything. And then they had, you couldn't smoke in there. You have to go upstairs in the back room, in the back of the stairs, because they didn't allow smoking. And then they used to give away, this didn't attract me, of course, but I do remember they'd give away prizes. And I, I want to, I can see the pieces. They were kitchenware things, and they were bowls and that kind of stuff would be given. And they had a crying room. The crying room was back in the corner where women with babies, infants, could come and the kids could cry and the, and the sound was piped into there. And they had a candy shop downstairs and the, my girlfriend would run the candy shop and they had ice cream and candy and it was really nice. 
very, very nice. I remember the night the theater caught fire. That was a horrible experience, seeing all the flames coming up from that. Yeah. That was a terrible experience to see history go up in smoke. And that was the saddest thing when that theater burned down. I mean, it brought people from many, many different places. And a friend of mine, he was the man that ran the, what do you call him, the projector? Yeah. And he came from Sacramento, and he just cried when he watched that. Because it's, uh, we were told many years ago that our theater had the best acoustics in Northern California. When it burned down, it was just something that broke everybody's heart. I've read that people have said the heart of Westwood was lost when the theater burned down. But I don't believe them. I can't. It's so clear in my mind. After seeing these pictures and hearing the stories, Westwood's heart never stopped beating. See, the people in the town went together. You couldn't have one without the other. It wasn't just anybody who could live in Westwood and do the type of work that had to be done. It wasn't for the faint of heart or the weak-spirited. The men and women who filled the factories in the woods, those who taught generations of kids, and the others who were part of daily life, Westwood flourished because of those people, and they continued to be its lifeline long after the mill shut down. They were the heart and soul of this town. They always have been, and they still are. It was just a good place to come live. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, well, it was a lot of fun, and, of course. Yeah, of course, kids got things to do all the time. They figured out something to do. It was a very nice town, and it was a very nice place to go to school in. We had wonderful teachers, and, uh, and then it was nice living in Pinetown over there. It really was. Westwood. We were, the, we were the people, you know. What the people here had for their own children was so good. Westwood was a, a good good place for me to come to. I, I had no regrets and still don't have any regrets. And here you are. And here I am. <laughs> Got my own place out at the cemetery, so it's well taken care of. All right. You're gonna stay. I'm I'm staying forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rambling pretty badly here, but there's a, a sense of Westwood that is imbued in most residents. I'm sure everybody didn't have good experiences here, but I think if you talk to most people, were their years in Westwood good? They'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs>